Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. For the second day in a row, Brian was shaking on the train. Just five more hours and he would be home. How he missed his family and his hometown. He was also happy that he would be celebrating New Year's not in a smoky train car with men, but at home. It had been his fifth year working on shifts, and it was the first time that his boss had suddenly given him time off for the holidays. Brian was both happy and a little sad as he looked at the huge plush teddy bear sprawled out on the third shelf. He was bringing it for his four-year-old son, Eric. The boy would be amazed by such a huge toy animal. Do you have a son or a daughter? asked Carl, his fellow traveler and also a shift worker. Carl was from Florida, while Brian had been working on a tractor in Houston. They met on the train. A son, Brian answered with a smile. I have a son and a daughter, Carl nodded. I'm also bringing them gifts. They're so huge though, a doll, a remote control car, and a fur coat for my wife. What about you? What will you give your wife for New Year's? I don't have a wife, Brian said after a brief pause. She passed away. I'm sorry, Carl sympathetically touched his shoulder. Maybe he wanted to know what happened to Brian's wife, but he didn't talk much during the whole journey and remained silent. Carl looked expectantly at Brian, but realizing that he wouldn't get any further information, he went to the vestibule, and Brian just sighed and stared out the window. Outside, the scenery was already flashing by, similar to the familiar landscape, and Brian was thinking and remembering. He and Caroline had been friends since first grade. They lived next door to each other, and then their first love swept them off their feet in ninth grade. Their parents argued and worried that their children would want to try adult life too soon. They dismissed the idea, thinking they were too young. Yes, and how could Brian hurt, offend his Caroline? You can't pick a bud before it's ready to bloom, he remembered. He liked that phrase, and he treated Caroline like the purest, brightest flower. They never had anything in school, although everyone in the area had long teased them about being engaged. After school, Carolina enrolled in a medical college, while Brian wanted to attend a technical university but failed. He joined the army instead, and after a send-off party, they had one secret night together by the lake in a shack. Will you wait for me? Brian asked while hugging her. How else could it be, we're together now. Together forever, Carolina whispered back. Two years in the army passed in agonizing waiting. Carolina wrote Brian so many letters, no one in their unit received as many. Even the other soldiers envied him, and Brian himself was afraid of jinxing it. As he left the army, he thought to himself, well, why is this taking so long? Carolina was the first to run up to him at the train station and hug him. Brian picked her up, kissed her, and then they snapped out of it. Carolina blushed and stepped away from Brian, looking at his parents who were standing nearby. His mother was already smiling, and his father too. Oh, my son chose a good girl for himself, he's been watching her since childhood, he said. Then there was the wedding. Their village was small, so half of the residents congratulated the newlyweds on their big day. Around 100 people were celebrating. Carolina and Brian were the happiest of all, their married life was beginning, and they imagined it would be cloudless and joyful. By that time, Carolina had already graduated from college and was appointed as a paramedic at the local factory in their village. Brian got a job as a tractor driver in the collective farm. His parents pitched in and bought a house for the newlyweds, and their family life began to flow. Oh, how happy Carolina was when she realized she was pregnant two months later. Carolina, are you sure? Brian couldn't believe it. I'm sure, Carolina laughed. I'm a medic myself, and I've already been to the district clinic. I'm seven weeks pregnant. Carolina, my dear, how much I love you. Brian exclaimed, spinning his wife around, and she laughed and kissed him on the head. And then that terrible incident happened in the fall. Carolina was walking home from a call when a huge dog jumped out of a dark alley and attacked the pregnant woman. And she was already about seven months pregnant, almost on maternity leave. The dog jumped on Carolina, pushed her, and she fell. 
It's unclear what else he would have done, but the dog's owner came out and dragged him away. Chad apologized for not noticing that the shepherd had broken free from his leash. Carolina listened, holding her stomach. She screamed. Chad took the dog home and called an ambulance. The medics quickly arrived and took Carolina away. But there was nothing they could do, their daughter died inside her womb. Carolina was then forced to give birth to a stillborn child. It was terrifying, very, very terrifying. Usually when a woman gives birth, she knows that joy will follow after the pains, a meeting with a dear little person, but here, only death. After that incident, Carolina took a long time to recover. She cried, and Brian suffered, blaming himself for not meeting his wife that evening. He was digging with a tractor in the collective farm shed until dark, if he hadn't been busy, none of it would have happened. But a year later, joy, a new pregnancy. This time Carolina was more careful than ever. Brian saw her off to work and met her after work when he could, of course, but he tried. And everything went well, only in the sixth month there was bleeding. For no reason at all, Carolina lost her baby boy. And tears came again. Brian tried to comfort his wife as best he could, although his own heart was torn apart by the pain. They survived this grief too, in work and business, everything seemed to be forgotten. A year later, a new pregnancy. Carolina didn't tell anyone until her stomach appeared. Only Brian knew about it. She went to register, oh, and the doctors scolded Carolina, they said she was a doctor herself, but behaved irresponsibly. Carolina just nodded in response. What else could she say? Her colleagues wouldn't understand. When you've already had two unsuccessful pregnancies, you become superstitious, whether you want to or not. And then Carolina was able to give birth to their daughter alive and healthy, just as they had hoped in the beginning. But Miranda was only one day old when she simply didn't wake up, she died in the hospital. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome They felt like they were going crazy. Carolina turned black with grief, Brian even started drinking, and only the support and help of their parents helped them pull themselves together. The doctors convinced Carolina and Brian to go to the city and get tested. The doctor identified some rare pathology in Brian, in principle, a viable child cannot be born from him. There is, of course, a chance that the baby can be born healthy, but it is only in theory, the genetic laboratory doctor honestly told him. How much? Brian asked. How much what? The doctor didn't understand. What is the percentage that I can have a healthy child? And he will be able to live and develop normally, Brian asked painfully. One percent, no more, the doctor replied, lowering his eyes. After that trip, Brian was not himself, he felt inadequate, damaged, he reached for the bottle again. Now he, not Carolina, pitted himself, what kind of man was he when he couldn't have children? Yes, he drank heavily, and Carolina blamed herself. Leave me, he yelled at her. You can still find a normal guy. You will have a child, and with me, you will only suffer." Carolina cried and did not leave. In the mornings she gave him hangover pills and went to work, where she forgot a little, and in the evening, Brian was back with his concerts. It is unknown how it would have ended, but then another trouble came. And it drove out another. Brian's parents were killed in a car accident. His father lost control on a slippery road and he and his mother died. This grief sobered Brian up. He realized how badly he had been behaving lately, like a rag. But his parents knew, they were upset. Mom, Dad, rest in peace, he whispered at the funeral. Don't worry, I won't take another drop, I won't shame our family and your memory. And he kept his word. He went back to work from which he was fired for skipping when he started drinking. But the thought of a child didn't let him rest, and he understood that Carolina was also thinking about it. One day he proposed to her. Carolina, what if you cheat on me, he said one evening. Carolina was washing dishes at that moment. Hearing these words, she looked at her husband in confusion. The cup slipped from her hands and shattered with a crash. What are you saying, she whispered palely. Are you drinking again? Not a drop he shook his head. I'm serious, Carolina. 
I know how much you want a child, and I want one too, but it's not happening for us. Yes, I told you to leave me, forgive me, it was emotional. I can't be without you. And I can't be without you, my dear, Carolina replied, sobbing, sitting down next to Brian and laying her head on his shoulder. Together, we are like two halves. Together, Carolina, we will stay together, he said. Just find someone to get pregnant, and I won't say a word. I don't need to know anything. Carolina, I will never stop loving you. We will continue to live together and raise our baby. Let's make a deal, Carolina raised her head and looked seriously at Brian. I didn't hear any of this, and you better not even think about me like that. I have never cheated on you, and I never will. I love you and only you. No children, and we don't need them. Let's just live together. Brian lowered his head. Honestly, he was waiting to hear these words from his wife, and he was happy to hear them, but at the same time, it hurt so much. That's why it happens in life, two people who love each other sincerely can't be truly happy. And yet they are together. Time passed. Carolina and Brian didn't try to have a child anymore. Carolina started taking pills, calmed down, and Brian forgot about it. That year turned out to be difficult again. At the beginning, Carolina's father-in-law died of illness, then the collective farm collapsed and went bankrupt. People were left without work, including Brian. True, later a new farmer came, started hiring people, but paid such meager wages that normal laborers just shook their heads. How can you work for almost nothing, for the man? Men started heading north. And Brian also found an advertisement in the newspaper that drivers and tractor drivers were needed in the north and headed there. And Carolina supported him. After all, she saw that Brian was languishing without work. And it was shameful for him, he was supposed to be the head of the family, but he was dependent on his wife. And before leaving, Carolina told Brian unexpected news, she was pregnant. How is that possible? Brian was confused. What about the pills? I stopped taking them, Carolina admitted. Why, Carolina? Brian looked at his wife with despair. You know how this will end. Why are you torturing yourself? I have no other choice, Carolina whispered. The doctor told you that there was a 1% chance of having a healthy baby. Brian, it's still 1%. A whole 1%. Carolina looked him in the eye. And I believe that we will succeed anyway. Brian hugged his wife. He was so worried. How could he go now? Who would take care of Carolina? It would be very difficult for her now, but Carolina assured him that she could handle it, and if anything, her mother, Mrs. Phillips, would help. You go and don't worry about anything, she smiled at him. I'm strong, I can handle it. You are my onion of sorrow, he smiled back and hugged his wife tightly for, goodbye. He had scolded Carolina a thousand times to take care of herself, and Mrs. Phillips had nagged her to watch her daughter. Both women nodded in agreement. Yes, they were also worried, the previous losses were still in their memory. But there was also hope. What if this was that one and only percent? Carolina believed, and Mrs. Phillips, who couldn't help it, also supported her daughter. Brian believed too. He came back after three months. He was home for a month. Carolina became pregnant and looked beautiful. Pregnancy suited her so well. She was going to have a boy. And neither Brian nor Carolina even talked about what to name their son. Each of them prayed for that same 1%, and then Brian took Caroline to the city. She was put on bed rest in the urban perinatal center five months before giving birth. The doctors were also very concerned, and Brian went to work and called his wife every day. Caroline was calm, and the pregnancy was progressing normally. And then the moment arrived. Brian just felt that Caroline had gone into labor, he became anxious, his heart pounding, and Caroline's phone was silent. He called her mother. I don't know anything yet, Mrs. Phillips answered tearfully. They only said that she was taken to the delivery room. And for almost a day, nothing was known. Then Caroline sent a text message. Darling, our boy was born. Everything is fine. 
Brian was so happy, but then he wondered. Why didn't Caroline write down the baby's height and weight? He started calling. The phone was not available. Mrs. Phillips didn't know any more than he did and was also worried. Brian barely got permission from his boss and rushed home. 2.5 days on the train. Mrs. Phillips met him at the station. Caroline and the baby will be discharged tomorrow, she blurted out at the meeting. Why is Caroline silent? The phone still doesn't answer, Brian was worried. Oh, there's something wrong with her phone. Don't worry, everything is fine with them. I talked to Caroline on the stationary phone, Mrs. Phillips reassured him. Brian rested after the trip, then started his old car, threw things for discharge, and rushed to the city for his wife and son. He will never forget the moment when Caroline came out into the reception room with the baby in her arms. The baby was in a neat envelope with a blue bow. And Caroline, so worn out, pale, and trying to smile, but somehow crookedly. Is everything okay? Brian asked, kissing his wife. Yes, my dear. Everything is fine, Caroline nodded and buried her face in the envelope with their son. Caroline. What's wrong? Don't cry. Everything is still good. Brian hugged his wife, then cautiously took his son in his arms, looked at his face, and smiled. Eric is sleeping. Eric? Caroline was surprised. Yes, let's name our son Eric. Eric is a beautiful American name. I don't mind. Let him be Eric, Caroline agreed. They arrived home without any adventures. Their little son behaved calmly, and he never caused any problems for his parents, he grew up healthy and strong. Although Carolina and Brian practically spent the first year sleeping beside his crib, listening anxiously to make sure he was breathing, out of fear from past losses, everything turned out fine. The doctors all said the same thing, the baby was perfectly healthy. He's our 1%, Brian happily said, looking at his sleeping son. Eric, my dear. He loved his son so much that it was impossible to express in words. And Carolina was now cheerful and happy, she was a mother. Eric grew up. By one, he was walking, and by two, he was babbling simple words, but his parents couldn't understand who he resembled more. His eyes were blue like Brian's, but his nose was slightly crooked like Carolina's, and his hair was a little curly, unlike both of his parents' straight hair. Oh, we forgot about Grandpa. Mrs. Phillips remembered. Carolina's hair used to be a little curly too, at your father's house. That's right, Carolina smiled. Yes, our son is picking up a little bit from everywhere, Brian laughed, picking up the baby and tossing him up in the air, catching him immediately. Eric laughed, showing off his strong, straight teeth. And now they were all truly happy. Brian continued to work on his shifts, bringing in good money. They bought a good car, repaired their house, and Brian bought Carolina a fur coat. Carolina used to scold him, but why bother? She was still on maternity leave, and Brian joked that his wife should be the most beautiful. And you're the best even without a fur coat, Brian hugged her. But in a fur coat, you have no equals. And they both laughed, but fate sent them a new trial. Carolina became ill. She became weak, her head hurt, and she felt nauseous. At first, she blamed it on tiredness, after all, taking care of a small child was so much work. Then she thought she might be pregnant again, but it wasn't confirmed. The doctors sent her to the city, and only then did they discover the reason for Carolina's discomfort. She had a tumor in her pancreas, and it was already in the third, and maybe even the fourth stage. The surgery won't produce any results, the doctors said. It's too late. The insidiousness of this tumor was that it couldn't be detected at an early stage, and now it was already inoperable. The doctors suggested a course of chemotherapy, although they honestly said that the chances were slim. Upon learning of her diagnosis, Carolina couldn't believe that this was happening to her. No, she couldn't get sick. She was young, healthy, and strong. She had no right to get sick. Afterward, she realized that this was true, and she would soon die from the chemotherapy. Carolina refused. 
Why, Brian yelled when he returned home from work. Carolina, this is a chance. You can't think about just yourself, think about Eric, think about me. Although, what about me, you have a little son, and he needs you. Needed, Carolina echoed him. But nothing can be done. You have to understand, this chemotherapy will only finish me off. I'll have to be in the hospital all the time. I know this as a medic. And I want to spend the time that I have left at home with you and our son. Brian then cried, hugging his wife, and Carolina cried on his shoulder. For a month, she felt more or less okay, and Brian even thought that the doctors were wrong, that Carolina was healthy. She was so busy with household chores, spending all her time with her son, and then suddenly weakened and fell ill. Mrs. Phillips moved in with them. She looked after Eric and secretly cried, realizing that her daughter was leaving, and Brian didn't want to believe it. He was with his wife until the very end. On that last evening, he approached Carolina. She seemed to be asleep. Brian straightened her blanket and sat down on a chair next to her bed. Carolina opened her eyes. Brian, Carolina whispered. Where is Eric? He's with his mom, don't worry. He's already going to bed, Brian kindly replied. You should rest too, my dear. Brian, I want to tell you, Carolina struggled to say what? Carolina suddenly choked and coughed. Brian raised her pillow and gave her a drink. Carolina, rest, he said. Brian, I'm leaving, Carolina whispered again. Eric. Please don't hurt him. What are you talking about? He is my son. Yes, your son. Our son, Caroline whispered with a fading voice and closed her eyes. Brian didn't immediately understand that she was gone. He thought she had fallen asleep, but when he touched her lips, he realized that she wasn't breathing. After Caroline's funeral, Brian was not himself for a month. He drank a few times, then pulled himself together, seeing the frightened eyes of Eric. The little one still couldn't understand where his mom had gone and often cried. Mrs. Phillips herself could barely stand from the grief she had experienced, but she watched over her grandson closely. She was always there. Brian, she said to her son-in-law. I understand everything, it's hard for you, but think of your son. I just keep crying, but you and he need your attention, fatherly attention. Brian seemed to wake up, hid his pain inside, spent more time with his son, played, and it seemed to get easier. And Eric asked less and less about Caroline, forgetting little by little, and then Brian went back to the north again, money was needed after all. Mrs. Phillips promised to take care of her grandson. And you go, she said to Brian before leaving. Work and don't think about anything else, and you'll find another woman, know that I won't object. I know you loved Caroline, but that's life. A man can't be alone for long. I don't need anyone else, but my son, Brian waved his hand. And indeed, no one else was needed. He worked and worked in the north. There were women there too, and some of them, quite pretty, looked at him. But he didn't pay any attention to it. All his thoughts were on his son. And when the management announced that they were letting everyone go until February, he was overjoyed. He was the first in the brigade to buy a train ticket and go to Eric. And before that, he went to the toy store at the station, and there was this huge beast, a white bear. Brian, when he saw it, got excited. That's exactly what he would give Eric, he earned good money after all. He arrived home early in the morning. Mrs. Phillips immediately bustled around the kitchen. She put the kettle on, started frying potatoes. Brian looked in on his sleeping son, admired him, how he had grown over the months. His boy is growing up. Oh. If only Caroline could see him. Brian placed the bear next to the bed and went to the kitchen. Today is the kindergarten morning performance, Mrs. Phillips said, brewing tea. Will you go? Of course, Brian nodded eagerly. What time? At noon. Eric is so excited about this holiday. He'll be dressed as a bunny. I made him a beautiful costume. Thank you, Brian said. If it weren't for you, I don't know what I would do. What else can I do, Brian? 
Eric is the only thing I have left from Carolina. As long as I breathe, I'll be with you, but just remember my words, if you find another woman, I won't object. Just find someone who won't hurt our Eric and will love him. Mrs. Phillips, I've already told you, I don't need anyone, Brian stubbornly said. Okay. We'll see, Mrs. Phillips sighed. And then they heard surprised exclamations from Eric's bedroom, and then his cry, then his sobbing. Brian and Mrs. Phillips rushed to the child. Eric was sitting on the bed, pressed against the wall, and looked at the bear with frightened eyes. Daddy, the little boy exclaimed, seeing his father. You came. And who is this? Son, it's a toy. A bear. Are you scared? Brian hugged his son and kissed his warm cheek. Son, I'm sorry, I didn't think. I thought you would be happy. Look how big and healthy it is. I wasn't scared, Eric shook his head desperately. I was just surprised. I fell asleep and nobody was here, and then he was standing there. Santa gave it to you, Brian smiled. I was on a train and he came in and said, give this to Eric. He was good this year, that's why he got such a big toy. Did he say anything else? Eric blinked his eyes. What else could he say? Brian was puzzled. At least say hello from mom, I really want to see her. She was in my dream today. Brian didn't say anything, just hugged his son tighter. What else could he say? We can't bring mom back even for such a powerful wizard as Santa Claus. She will only come to us in our dreams now, he whispered to his child. Then he shook himself, smiled, and put his son on his lap. It's your holiday today, probably. It's time to get ready. Yeah, Eric smiled. It's time. I'll be there as a bunny. Wow, that's cool. And what's so good about it? Suddenly frowned Eric. I wanted to be a wolf, but Hugh gets to be one. But the wolf is mean, and the bunny is nice, Brian exclaimed in surprise. No, your role is definitely better. Do you think so? The boy asked doubtfully and then remembered something else. And we were also told that a new boy will come to our celebration today. Where did he come from? Oh, right, I remember, Mrs. Phillips. A new worker came to our club, an art director or something. Nicole, our previous artist, ran away before the holidays. They say she left for the city with her lover. And there's so much work to be done at the club now. The director of the club went to the district center, begged for help. The culture department sent this girl to us. She's from the city, I think her grandmother lives in the district center, and she agreed to come to us. She was given a room near the club until spring. There's central heating there, she's alone with her child. So today her son will come. We haven't seen him yet, the teachers told us that we have a new addition. She only brought him from the district center yesterday evening. Brian listened with half an ear. He was not interested in this worn-out artist. He was thinking about how Eric would feel during the holidays. After all, children mostly come with their mothers. Eric will see it too, remember Caroline, and he might start to cry. But they'll figure something out with Mrs. Phillips and the boy. Thirty minutes before the holiday, Brian, Mrs. Phillips, and her son were already in the kindergarten. Eric obediently put on his bunny costume, Mrs. Phillips helped, and Brian was nearby ready to help. In short, they were all busy, like other parents who were also dressing up their children. And then the kids all ran into the hall, the teacher, Mrs. Cook, gathered them in a circle, gave them final instructions on how to behave. The adults sat on chairs and patiently waited for the start of the holiday. Where is the new kid? Suddenly someone among the parents remembered. Haven't seen him around. Yeah, all of ours, they confirmed in response, shrugging their shoulders. And then a young, attractive woman peeked into the hall. Have you not started yet? She smiled apologetically at the teacher. We're a little late. We had a Christmas tree at school, and I was helping out. I'm going to change Lucas now. Five minutes, okay, and she ran off to the dressing room. 
Everyone understood that this was the same woman who was sent to help the cultural workers at the club. Her name is Mary, I think, whispered one of the parents. One with a child, a four-year-old boy? Alone, another asked anxiously and looked suspiciously at the door behind which Mary had disappeared. And how is she in behavior? Well, who knows, they laughed in response. We'll see. But you have to hold on tight to your men. Look at how curvy and bright she is. Brian, take a look, his neighbor Mrs. Kelly winked at him, who had come to the celebration for her granddaughter. You're alone with us. I'm fine, Brian replied gloomily. And no one dared to say anything to him again. Mrs. Phillips lowered her eyes, thinking of her daughter. Mrs. Kelly realized she had said something foolish and also frowned, fell silent. The music started playing. Educators and nannies seated the children in front of the entrance. Participants of the performance, including Erica, were brought into the corridor. It was funny how the little ones in bunny, mouse, fox, and other animal costumes stretched in a line towards the exit. Parents smiled, watching their children. And then that same Mary fluttered into the hall with the boy. Nanny Miss Murphy picked up the boy, smiled, and was stunned for a moment. She looked at the parents confusedly, for some reason looked at Brian, or so it seemed to him. And then the woman led the child to an empty chair. Many mothers looked at Mary with curiosity, who settled in a corner and did not immediately notice the boy. But Brian sat as if someone had hit him on the head with a bag, a boy who looked just like Erica had just been brought into the hall. Brian even thought at first that it was his son. The same blue eyes, a slightly crooked nose, only the hair, Erica's were trimmed, only slightly curly on the crown, while this boy had a whole pile of flaxen curls framing his face with a hat. Mrs. Phillips also sat in bewilderment. Brian, I don't understand, she whispered. Maybe there's something wrong with my eyes. This boy looks so much like our Erica. Maybe I have something wrong with my eyes too, he whispered to her. He looked at Mary. She sat there, calmly smiling at her son, waving her hand, and he smiled back at her. Finally, some of the parents also noticed the baby. Brian, the little one looks just like your Eric, Mrs. Kelly whispered. And then she added impolitely, is he yours? Don't talk nonsense, hissed Brian. He was on edge. He wanted to jump up and immediately ask this Mary who she was. But that would be foolish. Brian sat there tense, not taking his eyes off the boy. Many parents also looked at the baby, his mother, Brian, and whispered among themselves. Then the show began, and everyone was distracted. The witch circled around the Christmas tree. The kids put on a performance. Then Santa Claus and his helpers arrived. After that, the children read poems and sang songs. Eric was having a great time. It was clear that he was very comfortable in his bunny costume, and the mask on his face didn't bother him at all. And then all the children went out to dance around the Christmas tree, including those who were sitting in chairs. The new boy also went. It so happened that he stood next to Eric. They took each other's hands and started singing, the little fir tree was born in the forest. Apparently, Eric became uncomfortable singing, and he raised his mask to his forehead. All eyes in the hall were once again focused on the two little boys. Eric and Lucas looked like two peas in a pod. Brian was also watching them. The man was completely lost, shifting his gaze from his son to his neighbor. Then Brian looked at Mary. By her pale and bewildered face, he understood that there was some secret that he did not yet know. After the holiday, parents and children gathered together to go home. The kids were happy, the parents were satisfied, but many would glance curiously at Brian and Eric, and then at Mary and Lucas. Mrs. Phillips, as if trying to shield her grandson from idle eyes, stood nearby, helping Eric. Mary quickly dressed her son, not looking at anyone. Brian also pretended that nothing had happened. He decided to talk later, without witnesses, to this unfamiliar girl. On the way home, Eric chattered non-stop. What a great holiday, he exclaimed. And Santa Claus was so kind. He gave me so many candies. And there was a new boy, Lucas, we met him while we were dancing. 
He gave me a lollipop, and I gave him chewing gum. He reminds me of someone, but I can't figure out who. Eric's father and grandmother listened silently and nodded their heads, each thinking about one thing. At home, Mrs. Phillips was the first to start a conversation with Brian. Maybe that boy is a double. They say that happens sometimes. Mrs. Phillips, do you believe in that? Brian shook his head. I don't believe in such fairy tales. And did you see Mary's face? She turned pale, scared of something. I don't understand anything. Eric is our grandson, ours. Caroline gave birth to him. But maybe she had twins? And... And the doctors didn't notice that, Brian said sarcastically. I understand, that could have happened in the early 20th century, but not now. Caroline carried only one child. Then how do you explain everything? Mrs. Phillips looked despairingly into the next room, where Eric was unpacking his bag of candies. Eric is my son, Brian said firmly. And I'm going to that woman to find out everything. He rushed out of the house, throwing on his jacket as he went. He almost ran to the club, paying no attention to passersby who were curiously looking at him. The whole village was already buzzing about how Brian had been with another woman while he was with Caroline, and had also gotten her pregnant. And now she had come back. I never would have thought Brian was capable of cheating on Caroline, the old women whispered, watching Brian go. He seemed so honest. He adores Caroline and loves Eric so much, but he's just like all the other men. And look at her, she must have found out that Caroline had died and rushed back here. No shame, no conscience. I feel sorry for Mrs. Phillips. How must she feel now, knowing that Brian is a womanizer? He lied to her daughter. That's fine, but what about the children now? Two brothers, it turns out? This is what young people are like. They don't realize what will happen later, and the children will suffer. In short, everyone in the village had decided that Brian was guilty. Mary was quite a girl. Many had already made their predictions. Ahead of everything, Mrs. Phillips would now curse her son-in-law and be proven right. Even better if Erica took her in. You can't entrust a son to such a wayward man like Brian. And Mary needs to smear tar or paint on her door, but where can she find it? And the chairman of the village council will clearly be displeased, the doors are public property. And why did he settle Mary in the club without knowing the person? Meanwhile, in a small room near the club, Mary feverishly packed her things in a suitcase. Little Lucas watched his mom in bewilderment. Mama, I don't want to leave here, the child murmured, barely holding back tears. I liked it here. There were other kids, a Christmas tree. Santa Claus gave me a present. Son, we can't stay here, the woman replied, almost crying herself. It'll be bad for us here. The bus is coming now, in two hours. We'll go back to Mrs. Reed's again, to the district center, and then I'll come up with something. I don't want to go to Mrs. Reed's, the little one cried. She scolds and hits me. She pulled my ear when I sat on her bed. We'll have to endure, little one. It won't be for long, Mary hugged her son and kissed his wet cheek. Unexpectedly, there was a knock on the door. Mary trembled at the sudden knock and stared at the door. It opened, and on the threshold stood the same man from the morning performance who had been looking at her all the time, the father of that boy. Good afternoon, he said. I'm Brian. We need to talk. Hello, Mary said in a low voice. Don't worry, we'll leave now. You and your wife don't have to worry about anything. My wife died. How? Is Carolina no longer with us? Mary said in confusion. No, who are you, damn it? Brian exclaimed. How do you know my wife? And how do you explain that our sons are like two drops of water? Mary turned to her son, then pleaded with Brian, I'll explain everything to you, just so the child doesn't hear. Let's go to the auditorium. She turned back to her son. Lucas, my sunshine, you can play here. Draw and eat your candies. I'll talk to Uncle Brian and come back soon. Lucas nodded despondently in response. 
He was worried that he would soon have to leave here and go to the mean Mrs. Reed. Brian and Mary walked to the auditorium. Brian sat in a chair, and Mary continued to stand. She collected her thoughts and didn't know where to start. Yes, it was her secret, and she had been living with it all these years. But it was so hard, simply unbearable. And today, when she saw Eric, her heart contracted as if it were wrapped in chains. She had to confess. How do you know my wife? Brian repeated the question. We were together in the maternity ward, Mary said, turning pale. And you took our second child? I didn't take anyone, the woman almost whispered. I gave my second son to your wife. Carolina had a stillborn baby at the time. What? Brian exclaimed. This can't be. Eric is my son. But that's the truth. I'll tell you my story, and you can decide for yourself if it's true or not. And Mary told Brian her story, without going into too much detail, of course, but in reality, it was a long and sad story. Mary grew up in an orphanage. She was a very artistic girl from childhood, so the question of where to go to study after school was not a problem. Mary enrolled in an art college. As an orphan, she was given a room in a dormitory. She studied easily. After receiving her diploma, she got a job at the House of Culture in the city, where she was noticed by one of the wealthy patrons. Mr. Davis was already over 50, and Mary was just a girl, 22 years old, but the man could not control himself. He didn't give the girl any space, he sent her flowers to work, met her in the evenings outside the House of Culture, and offered to drive her home. Mary didn't want his persistent attention. She refused his advances as much as she could, but that only made him more excited. He kept sending her bouquets, chocolates, and inviting her to restaurants over and over again. I don't understand you, Mary, said her friend Rachel, who worked as a designer at this cultural center. This guy is running after you, and you're turning up your nose. If something like that happened to me, I would rush into his arms without thinking twice. Rachel, he has a wife, and his children are already grown. His daughter is my age, I checked, Mary replied. So, you're still interested in him, Rachel winked. The internet is helpful. You can find everything about this banker, Mr. Davis. His wife has a chain of beauty salons, his son is a schoolboy, and his daughter is 23 and works at his bank. But who cares about his family? Let them live as they did before. You'll be in a good place. He'll rent or maybe buy you an apartment, and you can move out of your bug-infested place. He'll shower you with gold and diamonds. Mary, agree to it. But he's old and unpleasant. What do you mean old? He's only 50. However, Mary didn't want to listen to her friend, and one day, she returned home late from an event. Suddenly, a car stopped next to the sidewalk, and two strong men pushed her into the salon. They brought her to a luxurious country house where Mr. Davis was waiting for her. The table was set. Wine, champagne. The owner was in a robe. Sit down, Mary. The banker pointed to a chair, then poured her wine. You're here with me, despite your resistance. You have to understand that I can't be refused. I always get what I want. I will report you to the police, Mary replied, trembling. Me? For what? Mr. Davis laughed out loud. For helping poor fools in this life? Mary, you are really a fool. I will make you rich. And the police. Don't worry, I have my connections there. The top boss owes me a lot of money, he's like putty in my hands. So let's have some wine, eat some fruit. Relax, we still have the whole night ahead of us. He enjoyed his power over Mary, saw the fear in her eyes, and it amused him, and then he just mocked her. In the morning, he put her in the same car with the same brave guys, put some thousands in her pocket, and said he would call her in the evening. And don't even think about not picking up the phone, he hissed in her ear. You're mine now. I'll make you a queen if I want to, or I'll destroy you if I want to. Mary cried all the way home. Mary, don't be foolish, one of them said to her when they arrived at the house. 
You can't go against Mr. Davis. Do as he says. Mary was crushed. It was so mentally and physically heavy, she wanted to hide and disappear so that no one would find her. But in the evening, someone knocked on her door. Mr. Davis was standing in the doorway, and his satisfied, smug face was shining. He smiled. Fat pig, Mary thought with disgust. She wanted to shut the door in his face, but she didn't have time. He put his foot in the doorway. Get ready quickly, we're going to my country house, he said, winking. Mary felt so repulsed by the man, but Mr. Davis had a way of acting on her like a skilled hypnotist. She felt like a rabbit in front of a huge snake. And Mary went with him. They met several times after that. The banker was elated. He got what he wanted. And Mary felt so miserable, and she felt dirty, as if she had been scrubbed by the floor. Mr. Davis was generous. He gave her jewelry, flowers. Rachel, who saw Mary with new earrings or a ring, only sighed enviously, thinking how lucky her friend was. And then it all ended one day. Mr. Davis's wife appeared during one of their dates at his country house. She didn't scream or make a scene, she just smiled and said, Oh, you again, darling. Mr. Davis grabbed Mary and literally threw her out onto the street, then fell at his wife's feet, realizing how much he owed her. He had built his entire business thanks to her father. Of course, she forgave him, not for the first time. And Mary, honestly, was even glad it happened that way. Mr. Davis wouldn't bother her anymore. And indeed, he had played enough. He didn't call or come over anymore. Of all of them, only Rachel was disappointed that old goat abandoned his friend. And Mary finally breathed a sigh of relief. It was liberation. At first, she wanted to throw away the earrings and ring that Mr. Davis had given her. Rachel convinced her otherwise. Pawn your jewelry advised her friend. Extra money won't hurt. So Mary did just that, and regretted it soon after. A week later, Mr. Davis showed up and demanded that she return all the jewelry. When he found out that Mary had sold them for a pittance, he flew into a rage. You'll pay me for them, he yelled. Sell your room in the dormitory and give me everything. Mary sent him away. Eventually, she was able to stand up to him. She didn't know why, maybe she had grown up. But it was too early for her to celebrate feeling free. Soon Mary felt terrible, especially in the mornings. Friend, what's wrong with me? Rachel asked her. Mary herself realized that it was likely what she feared. The doctor at the women's clinic confirmed it. You're seven weeks pregnant, she said. It was a shock, and Mary didn't understand what to do. Rachel gave her the address of a clinic where she could quickly solve the problem, and Mary went there because she knew it was the best option in this situation. At the clinic, Mary was given a referral for an abortion. It was supposed to be done in two days, but by the evening Mary had a fever and her stomach hurt terribly. She was taken to the hospital by an ambulance. It turned out to be appendicitis. Mary had surgery, then a recovery period. By the time Mary came to her senses, it was too late for an abortion. She had to give birth, but who needed this child anyway? And then, feeling bold, Mary went to Mr. Davis and told him everything. Pregnant, he sneered in her face. You're a grown girl and you should solve your own problems. I'm not interested anymore. But it's your child. Mary exclaimed. And why should I believe you, he asked. Who are you? A scum from under the fence. Don't you dare approach respectable people with your bastard. And he left. Mary stood there in horror, realizing that no one would help her in this life. Yes, she would have to solve her own problems. A week later, Mr. Davis's wife came to Mary's room. I heard from my husband that you're going to have his baby, she said, smirking. Too bad. You must understand that Mr. Davis will never acknowledge this child. I'm not asking him or you for anything, Mary replied, raising her head. You're so brave and proud now, but when your puppy is born, you'll sing a different tune, the guest hissed through her teeth. So, get out of town so that your spirit won't be here in three days. 
got it? And what if I don't? Mary calmly looked at the woman in expensive clothes and was not afraid of her at all. Then you'll regret being born, the woman snapped at her and left, slamming the door, but Mary didn't take her threat seriously. She continued to live peacefully, but one night three masked men burst into her room, pulled her out of bed, took out some papers from a folder they brought with them, and forced Mary to sign them. She never understood what she had signed, and in the morning, new owners of her room came and presented documents for the sale. Mary's protestations that she had signed everything under duress and had not received any money fell on deaf ears with the police. Mary found herself alone on the street, pregnant, and with no money. Where to live? At work? And that's when Rachel helped. She rented a small studio and sheltered her friend. But what to do next? And then came the stunning news. You're having twins, the doctor said at the next appointment. Twins? Mary cried in tears. How? Why? I won't be able to handle it. You can, dear, the doctor smiled. Besides, you don't even have to give birth, given your recent operation. You need a cesarean section. You'll wake up, and you'll already have two dolls. Mary walked out of the hospital without paying attention to the way. How could she have gotten into this mess? Pregnant by a scoundrel. And with twins at that. So, friend, don't drift away, Rachel comforted her when she found out everything. We'll make it through. Easy for you to say. What am I supposed to do now? Where to live with two children, how to raise them? I'll be forever imposing on you. Leave them in the maternity ward, Rachel suggested. Are you serious? Mary even opened her mouth in shock at such a proposal. No. Well, what else can you do? Think about it yourself, do you need them? No, if only they were from someone you loved or from a decent person, but they're from the last scoundrel. But these are my children. Rachel, I myself grew up in an orphanage and do not want such a fate for my children. So what? You had it good there, everything was provided for you, and they even gave you housing. Which I lost, Mary added thoughtfully. It's no big deal. Once you give birth to these children, leave them in the maternity ward. A new life will begin. Everything will be fine, my friend, and you will forget it like a bad dream, her friend encouraged her. Mary understood that Rachel was right. Why did she need these children? Who was their father? She flinched every time she remembered the fat banker. No, nothing should bind them. And Mary decided to leave the children in the maternity ward. But time passed, her belly grew, and with it, the maternal feeling of the young woman awakened. She gently stroked her belly, smiled when the little ones moved inside. No, it didn't hurt, it was even pleasant, as if butterflies were flapping their wings. Two beautiful boys, the doctor said at the next ultrasound. Boys. Her two little sons. She wouldn't give them to anyone. Mary decided that when the time came, she would put them on their feet herself. They would not grow up in an orphanage. Rachel did not tell her about her plans, later, everything later. A week before the planned C-section, she was admitted to the hospital. She met Caroline in the ward before giving birth. Caroline also went to the hospital in the last days, she was very worried. This is my fourth child, Caroline confessed to Mary. You have such a large family? Mary was surprised. Unfortunately, no, the new acquaintance said bitterly and told Caroline her story. Everything will be fine this time, Mary encouraged her. Caroline just nodded slightly in response, she was afraid to say something to jinx it. One day they were taken away, Mary for surgery, and Caroline with contractions. When it was all over and Mary was transferred from the intensive care unit to a regular ward, it turned out that her neighbor was Caroline. Caroline lay, turned away from the wall, and cried quietly. Mary looked at her with concern and understood everything. Is it bad? She only asked. It couldn't be worse, Caroline sobbed. My little boy didn't make it. He only took a breath and died. How could this be? Lord, I prayed so much for you to save his life. 
Caroline, dear, don't cry. Mary, wincing from pain herself, turned to Caroline. Everything will be fine. Yes, nothing will be okay, cried Carolina. This is the fourth child I'm mourning. Do you understand, the fourth one? I don't know how to tell my husband, and I don't know how to tell my mom. They're also waiting and hoping, but my little one is already in the morgue. It's so scary. And I feel sorry for Brian. He wants to become a father so badly, but it's not happening. He has a problem, but I will never abandon him. Can you imagine telling him again that the baby didn't make it? He already broke down before. He drank, feeling his own worthlessness. And now, again. I am strong, I will cope. I'm afraid for Brian. Mary listened to her confession, and a plan suddenly formed in her head. She had given birth to two healthy babies. She hadn't seen them yet, but the doctor said the boys were perfectly healthy. But how could she manage with two babies, alone, without a home, without money? Carolina, I'll give you one of mine, she said hoarsely. Will you take him? What are you talking about? Carolina gasped. You see, it will be difficult for me to manage with them alone. I'm already living with a friend on probation. She advised me to give them to an orphanage. But I can't. They're my own flesh and blood. How can I give them away like puppies? So I thought, maybe my friend will accept me with one baby, but with two, unlikely. And then it's better to drown them. I see that you're a good person, and your husband, from what you've told me, is not bad either. My son will be well off with you. So, do you agree? I don't know, Carolina whispered, confused. And they didn't sleep all night, tossing and turning. One was thinking about whether she could accept someone else's child, while the other was wondering if she could bear to give away her own flesh and blood. At dawn, Carolina called out to Mary in a whisper. Are you sleeping? No, Mary answered shortly. I've made up my mind. I'll take your baby. But let's make sure that no one knows, neither your acquaintances nor my relatives. For my husband and mother, I gave birth to a healthy baby. Yes, I agree. We just need to convince the doctor to change the children's documents. It's difficult, but it's possible, Mary replied. She remembered that she had a small gift from Mr. Davis, a diamond ring. She didn't take it to the pawn shop, and when Mr. Davis demanded the return of his jewelry, she couldn't find it. The ring had rolled under the lining of her bag. Later, she found it. Now it could come in handy. Do you realize what you're asking me? The doctor yelled at them in the office when the women told him about their request. Okay, Mary, young and foolish, but you, Carolina? You're also a medic, you understand that it's impossible in principle. I understand, but please understand me too. I want to be a mother. I'm tired of mourning my children, and this is a chance, Mary said. So go to the orphanage, take a baby from there, the doctor shook his head. No, I can't. And I refuse the children, Mary suddenly said loudly. Mary, are you okay? Two wonderful boys. How could you? The doctor looked at the young mother in bewilderment. I won't be able to raise them alone, let alone two. Please don't let me do something irreparable. I'll take one child and give the other to Carolina. She's good, I feel it. My boy will be in good hands. She approached the table and put the ring down, not saying anything else, and left the office, followed by Carolina. Both felt pain and heaviness in their hearts, nothing worked out. And an hour later, the door opened, and the nanny brought in two bundles. Well, mothers, take your babies, the woman said cheerfully. She looked at the tag on one, then the other, and immediately handed one baby to Carolina and one to Mary. The women stared at each other in amazement, and then each looked at her own baby. Within moments, each was already feeding her baby. And he looks like me, Mary smiled, looking at the sleeping baby in her arms. And then the smile fell from her face. She looked at Carolina's baby. She understood that look and held the baby tighter. You promised, she whispered, pale. I remember. 
I just wanted to see what he looks like, Mary said. Don't do it, Carolina begged. Let him be my son. Yes, you're right. He's your son, Mary whispered and closed her eyes. A tear rolled down her cheek. She never got to see her second baby, and by evening they were separated into different wards. The doctor had decided it was the right thing to do. Why make these poor women suffer even more? He had helped them as much as he could. When Carolina was discharged with her baby, Mary was still in the hospital. She stood by the window and watched Carolina walk with her second son to a car where a tall man was waiting. He smiled happily, said something to Carolina, and then they got into an old car and drove away. Where to, Mary didn't know. Carolina didn't say where she was from, only mentioned that she lived somewhere in the area. Well, Mary didn't need to know. She had decided that her second baby would be happy in another family, and she would raise this little one. She didn't hear the doctor approach her, he was also watching Carolina drive away. Regretting it? he asked Mary quietly. The young mother was startled. No, she shook her head. Carolina will be a good mother. I hope so, girls, we did the right thing, the doctor sighed, then pulled out the ring from his pocket. Take it, you need it more, and he left the ward. And Mary watched him gratefully. What a good doctor. Rachel picked up Mary and the baby from the hospital. Of course, her friend was a little stunned when she learned that Mary had decided to keep the baby. But, to be honest, deep down she approved of her friend's decision. Rachel had thought a lot about this situation, even imagined herself in Mary's place, and understood that giving away her child was not so easy. At least there's only one, Rachel thought to herself. She even comforted her friend and was surprised at how calmly she reacted to the death of her second baby. Rachel decided that Mary was even happy. Yes, in her situation, it was the best option. Lucas grew up. He was a calm and affectionate baby, healthy, and that made Mary very happy. To her surprise, Mary realized that she did not see her son as Mr. Davis's child. He was just her baby, and she did everything to make sure the little boy lacked nothing. When he was six months old, she started working. She organized holidays and parties. During that time, Rachel would watch Lucas. Her friend turned out to be a good babysitter, but she also had her own life. No, she never blamed Mary for restricting her, but the young mother herself understood that she needed to solve her housing issues. At one year old, she sent Lucas away for five days and started working two or even three times as much. She took on a lot of orders. Sometimes she would come to Luda's apartment and collapse from exhaustion, but she had to work so that Lucas wouldn't need anything. But then Mary realized that her baby was growing up abandoned and unhappy in such a rhythm. Who needs him there in daycare for five days? And on the weekends, when she picks him up? Because again, she has to leave for weddings or birthdays, but there's no other way. After all, she was fired from the cultural center where she used to work, as she later heard, because of a call from some influential person. Who? Mary didn't even bother to ask, she knew it was either Mr. Davis or his wife. So she lived in a crazy rhythm with a constant feeling of guilt towards her son. But one day everything changed. Rachel's aunt got sick in a small town far from the regional center. She's mean, old, Rachel would say. But my mother owes her. She's her sister, after all. She used to borrow money from my mother a lot, but now she can barely walk around the house. She has no children, no husband, not even a cat. I'm telling you, she's as mean as a devil. So she asked my mother to look after her. But how can my mother? They left that town long ago, to the neighboring district. Neither my mother nor my father wants to move there. The social worker is being driven away by the aunt. My mother calls me, crying, not knowing what to do. And Mrs. Reed doesn't want to move there either. So I thought, what if you go there? There's a daycare and a new club there. The aunt may be mean, but she's not a witch, she'll accept you. Where else can she go? You'll have a place to live with Lucas, and you'll find a job, and most importantly, you'll look after the aunt. She won't let us in, Mary hesitated. 
We're strangers to her. That's my problem, Rachel winked. I'll convince her, otherwise I'll tell her I'm going to give her to a nursing home. My main concern is that you agree. Probably yes. I agree, Mary shrugged. I don't have many options, and I'm so tired, and Lucas keeps crying all the time. It's hard for him to be without his mom for five days at daycare. Exactly. So, it's settled, I'll call my aunt, Rachel exclaimed with joy. It's unclear how Rachel convinced her stubborn aunt, but she agreed too, although she was very upset that a woman with a child would be staying with her. But then she fell silent after hearing that the only other option was a home for the elderly. And so Mary and Lucas were on the train. The boy was happy. Would he really see his mom every day now, not just on weekends? You won't abandon me again for five days, will you? He sometimes realized and whispered to Mary for the hundredth time. No, my little one, never again, Mary assured him. The woman held her son close and thought that, despite all the difficulties, she was happy. She had a baby, her purpose in life, her joy, her hopes, and everything would work out for them. Did Mary ever think about her second child? Of course, sometimes it hurt in her chest, but Mary forbid herself any memory of those events in the maternity hospital. She didn't tell anyone, not even Rachel, and she never will. Her second son didn't survive back then, and that was that. They got off at a small station. After the huge city, the silence seemed to overwhelm them. The scene amazed them, small houses, narrow streets, but it was just unusual. And so this small town was the most ordinary, like thousands across the country. They easily found the wooden house with carved shutters and an iron fence on the right street. Mrs. Reed lived here. She opened the door for them. A woman in her seventies, plump, with a dissatisfied face. Mary noted to herself that she wasn't that helpless, she moved quite decently. She just needed to lose some weight, but that was not her concern. Thank you for agreeing to take them in. So, Rachel sent you to me, Mrs. Reed looked them over and said. Well, okay, stay for now, and then we'll see. Your room is over there. Go, make yourself comfortable, and tell your boy not to run around and scream in the house. Sit in the room. And that's it. Oh, and don't sit there for too long, I need to stoke the stove and cook. Come on, get moving. Saying all this in a commanding tone, Mrs. Reed went to the living room and turned on the TV at full volume. Lucas wanted to sleep after the trip, but how could he fall asleep here? Okay, son, you'll have to bear with it. You'll sleep well when you go to the daycare, Mary whispered. Mama, you promised, Lucas recoiled from his mother with tears in his eyes. You said you wouldn't send me away for five days. But this is not a five-day thing, Mary assured him. Every evening I will come and pick you up, here. This is our home now. Really, are you promising, the child looked at his mother skeptically. I promise, Mary smiled. We just need to find this daycare, and for now, you need to behave and not bother your grandmother. The room turned out to be bright, with one bed, a creaky wardrobe, and a three-legged table. A small window in an old wooden frame. But even that was happiness, they had their own little corner. Mary quickly unpacked and went to work. Everything would have been fine if she knew how to heat the stove. Oh, and did she get an earful from Mrs. Reed, she was incompetent and clumsy. Why did she even listen to Lyudka? Mary silently listened to everything, watched as Mrs. Reed worked on the stove, and understood everything right away. And then she cooked borscht. Very tasty. Mrs. Reed ate two servings, Lucas also had a good meal from the trip, but Mary was so tired that she only nibbled like a bird. You eat well, Mrs. Reed said. But your little one eats like a horse. He will eat me out of house and home. What are you talking about? Mary was offended. He's just a little kid. He was just hungry from the trip. Don't worry, I'll buy groceries with my own money. I'll work, Lucas will be in daycare. We won't bother you. I don't understand, Mrs. Reed was confused. How can you work and take care of me? I will manage everything. I'll do all the chores in the morning, cook food. 
And in the evening, I'll come back. Rachel told you all about it, Mary replied. She did, Mrs. Reed answered irritably. Damn it, Rachel got me into this mess. Bringing strangers into my house. Damn Rachel. And, grumbling something else, she went to her room. Mama, I'm scared of her, Lucas whispered. Don't be afraid, little one. Grandma is good, she just grumbles a little, Mary smiled, although she was also anxious, Mrs. Reed was so inhospitable. On the next day, she went to the local house of culture and then to the kindergarten. At the house of culture, they offered her only a cleaning lady position, and only because no one else wanted to work for those pennies. She had to work for free in the cloakroom in the evenings during the discos. However, they promised to take Lucas to the kindergarten right away. The only thing needed was a local registration. But where to get it? It was a closed circle. Mary decided to take her son to work with her and work as a cleaning lady for now. What else could she do? Of course, this was not what she dreamed of, but that's how it turned out. Mary's new life began. She woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, prepared breakfast for the landlady, then heated the stove, and ran to the club. While her son slept, she cleaned there and came back by lunchtime. Lucas sat in the room, drawing or playing with toy cars, only quietly. Mary taught him not to disturb his grandmother. Until the evening, the woman managed the housework and then went to work again, taking Lucas with her. They often returned after midnight when the club closed after various events and discos. The head of the club, Mrs. Wood, turned a blind eye to the fact that the new cleaning lady often took her son with her. She saw that the girl was trying her best, and she had her own education and was a colleague. Mary, just be patient, Mrs. Wood said. As soon as a place opens up somewhere, I'll find a job for you and get you a place in the kindergarten. Wait a month or two. Mary gratefully smiled at her. That's how she lived. In November, it became difficult to carry Lucas to work in the evenings. It was cold to walk on the street. Mary decided to talk to the landlady. He won't bother you, she assured Mrs. Reed. He'll just sit in the room. Okay, let him stay, the old woman relented. Everything suited her. The house was warm, clean, always delicious food, and a boy, she'll punish him if anything happens. Mary began leaving the boy with Mrs. Reed. At first, she didn't notice anything, but then she realized that her son became somewhat fearful, and she saw bruises on his hand. It turned out that the old woman punished him for every little mistake, she would pull his ear or slap him. Once Lucas forgot himself and climbed onto her bed in her room. The old woman pinched his hand. She also pinched him a few more times for small, as she thought, mistakes. Mary's son later told her about it when she saw the bruises. Why were you silent? Mary asked, almost in tears. I was afraid to upset you, Lucas replied seriously, not like a child. You're already going through a lot. Mary then had a big argument with Mrs. Reed, and the old lady had only one response, if you don't like it, leave. And then it seemed like Mary got lucky. A position for an art director opened up in one of the villages, just before the new year. However, she would have to live at the club. Are you going? Mrs. Wood asked. I'm going, Mary replied decisively. On the same day, Rachel called, explained the situation with her aunt, and apologized. Friend, don't apologize, Rachel sighed. I should be the one apologizing to you for such an aunt. But now she can live as she wants. I think she's just being silly rather than really sick, Mary said. Then all the more reason for her to live alone, Rachel chuckled. The next day, Mary and Lucas left for the village. Oh, how Mrs. Reed scolded them. Ungrateful Mary. She had lived with her like a queen. But Mrs. Reed, of course, regretted the free help from Mary, and also because her lodger paid for her stay. Mary liked the village. The street was flat, there were many new houses, and the people were friendly. The club director brought her old furniture to her room, personally went to the nursery and arranged for the son of the new employee to be accepted there. Let him go to the Christmas tree tomorrow, 
Ella, the club manager, said, and held her gaze on Lucas, who was sitting on a chair and curiously examining their new home with his mother. What a cute little boy. He looks like you. Yes, Mary smiled. There is a resemblance. He reminds me of someone else, Ella mused. Oh well, all children look alike in some way. That's for sure, Mary laughed. Thank you, Ella. For what? For everything, for shelter, for help. Anytime, Ella winked and ran off to her own affairs. And the next day, Mary went to the nursery with her son for the Christmas tree, and there was this unexpected encounter. Of course, she didn't tell Brian about her life in detail, just that she was almost homeless, pregnant with twins, how she met Caroline, and decided to take this step. She also told him how she wanted to improve her life in this new place. We will leave with Lucas, she said, wiping away her tears. I won't disrupt your life. Let's gather our things and leave on the bus. Where to? Anywhere, really. I understand that we don't belong here. People will start talking now that they've seen how much the boys look alike. I think people are already talking, Brian said with a sad smile. He paused to reflect. Eric wasn't his biological son. Brian still couldn't believe it, but he remembered meeting Caroline at the hospital, how lost and upset she was. She looked at him as if she wanted to say something but didn't and passed away. She clearly wanted to confess something but couldn't or didn't have time. Yes, Caroline lied to him. That thought burned him, but what hurt more was that Eric wasn't his son. Brian sat with his head down while Mary stood in front of him. She pressed her back against the wall and cried, remembering the events of her life once again. Everything was so messy. Lucas was such a pity. Where would they go now, on the eve of New Year's? Rachel would welcome them in her city, but she had her own life, and it seemed she had a man. Mrs. Reed. Lucas had already suffered enough from that spiteful old lady, but they had nowhere else to go. They would have to go back to Mrs. Reed, even if she wasn't welcoming. Lucas peeked into the room. He looked at his crying mother and sad uncle in surprise. Mama, I'm hungry, he said with a whine. Oh yes, my dear, Mary perked up. I'll go to the store and buy some sausages, fry them up quickly with eggs. We have a bus to catch soon. She was about to leave, but Brian stopped her. The store is already closed, he said. Brian stood up and approached Mary, looking into her eyes. Where are you planning to go? It looks like you're running away. That's exactly what it is, Mary whispered. But there's no other way. Why don't you come with us? Brian suddenly offered. Mrs. Phillips was going to make borscht today. To your place? Mary was taken aback, but how? Brian took Mary's hand and looked into her eyes again. Don't you want to see him, talk to him, he asked. Mary lowered her head. She understood who Brian was talking about. She really wanted to see her Eric, to see how he was living, to hug him. She wanted to. But could she? She made her choice once. I really want to, she whispered. Then let's go, Brian said a bit sharply. Stop thinking. Your son is hungry. Almost unnoticed, he switched to using informal youk in Russian. They walked through the village, not noticing how all the neighbors were staring at them from their windows and yards, but Brian didn't care about any of it. He had only one thought in his head, is it right to allow Mary to see Eric? And yet, Eric was his son, not by blood, but Brian was raising him and wouldn't give him up to anyone. Would he regret this sudden impulse? And there was also Mrs. Phillips, who didn't know anything yet. In the hallway, they were met by Mrs. Phillips, who stared at the guests, at Brian, with incomprehension. Mary stood hesitantly at the threshold, holding Lucas to herself. The boy looked around with curiosity, examining his new home and the kind old woman who was nothing like Mrs. Reed. Brian, please explain, Mrs. Phillips said, bewildered. Who are these guests? This is Mary and her son, Lucas, Brian introduced them. Mrs. Phillips, the boy is hungry and needs to be fed. And Mary is probably hungry too. 
No, no, I'm on a diet, the woman shook her head. Brian just waved his hand. I'm not accepting any excuses. Mom, please feed them, he asked gently. Mrs. Phillips was surprised once again. Brian had always treated her very well, but in all these years he had never called her a mom. What had happened? Okay, friends, let's wash our hands and sit at the table, the woman commanded and went to the kitchen. Soon, Eric joined them. Seeing Lucas, he smiled happily. Hey! Did you come to visit us? Lucas just nodded in response, looking a little overwhelmed. Eric, let's go to the table too, Mrs. Phillips called her grandson. The boys ate with great appetite, then ran off to Eric's room. There they played with that huge teddy bear, turning it over, trying to climb on it, and laughing. They somehow became friends immediately. The adults sat in the kitchen, listening to the children's noise. And each one couldn't bring themselves to start the conversation first. Brian, I'm listening, Mrs. Phillips finally said. I don't know how to say it, Brian shook his head. Just say it already, Mrs. Phillips almost shouted. I don't understand anything. Lucas is a spitting image of Eric. Did Carolina leave one child at the hospital? No, I can't believe it. Everything is not as it seems, Mary decided to reply. I gave birth to Erica and Lucas. They're twins. Hearing this, Mrs. Phillips paled and clutched at her heart. The news was shocking. So, her daughter had deceived everyone? And Mary just kept talking and talking. Caroline wanted to do what was best, Mary explained. She wasn't thinking about herself when she was in the hospital. She was scared to imagine how you, Mrs. Phillips, would react. She was very worried about Brian. She couldn't tell you that she had lost another baby. And then there was me. I have a healthy set of twins. And it should be something to be happy about, but I can't be. I have nowhere to go with the boys, nothing to raise them on, and I can't put them in an orphanage. I grew up in one myself, and I know it's not easy. I came up with everything and suggested it to Caroline. Then I talked to the doctor, and God knows, I would never have appeared in your life, but circumstances worked out that way. I ended up in your village by some unknown means. You're lying, Mrs. Phillips exclaimed. You want to take our son away. I won't give him up. You're mistaken, I want to take Eric from you the least, Mary replied. I see how happy he is here. But Lucas. I can't give him anything. I haven't really made anything of my life, and it hurts a lot. But I'll manage. I can do it. I didn't want to say anything to you, but Brian insisted. Mary fell silent, and then pleaded. Please just let me hug Eric, and we'll leave with Lucas. Mrs. Phillips didn't say anything. She turned to the window and thought. Brian was silent too. Caroline, why didn't you say anything then? Did you pity us? These were the thoughts that were in both Brian and Mrs. Phillips' minds. And they didn't know what to do next. Meanwhile, Mary listened as the boys played happily in the room. Can I go in there? She asked quietly. Brian nodded in response, but Mrs. Phillips suddenly got angry. No, get out, she shouted. I won't give you my grandson. No matter what you say, no matter how you plead, you abandoned him. Get out of our house. Mary didn't say anything. She just hunched her shoulders even more. She became very small, like a child. She walked to the door and looked back. Can you call Lucas? She timidly asked Brian. He went into the room and froze at the threshold. The boys were standing in front of the mirror, examining their reflections. Lucas, you have the same eyes as me, Eric said thoughtfully. Yeah, agreed Lucas. And the same hair, only mine is longer. Eric, maybe we're brothers? The adults were silent, so everyone could clearly hear the boys' conversation. No, that's not possible, Eric reasoned. Brothers have the same mom, but we have different ones. Lucas, you're lucky. You have a living mom, while mine is in heaven. That's what my grandma told me. 
but you have a dad and a nice house, sighed Lucas. Hey, come over to my place more often, we'll play. Okay, Lucas happily agreed. Then he remembered. But we're leaving. Mom said so, but I don't want to go. Mary couldn't listen to this anymore. Lucas, let's go, it's time, she shouted from the front door. Lucas obediently ran out and got dressed. Eric came out to see him off. They even hugged each other, goodbye. But you have to come over to my place again, Eric said. Lucas sadly smiled. It all depended on him, and the little one understood that. Lucas was mature for his age. In the courtyard, Mary caught up with Brian. Mary, don't be upset with Mrs. Phillips. Understand that it's also very difficult for us to understand and accept everything right now, but it's twice as hard for her. She lost her daughter, and Eric is no one to her. She's lost. I understand, Mary nodded. Excuse me, we're leaving. The bus had already left, but there would be another one tomorrow. Don't worry, we'll leave, and she took her son's hand tightly and walked away from the courtyard. Mary walked down the street, tears streaming from her eyes. Who was to blame for everything that had happened? Her, and only her. Her second son was right next to her, but she wasn't even allowed to touch him. Yes, I'm to blame for everything, and why am I crying? She whispered to herself. What will you give him? You can barely take care of one. Lucas looked at his mom in surprise and didn't understand why she was crying and talking to herself. He only realized that his mom was very upset, so he held her hand tightly. Mommy, the boy whispered as they returned to their room in the club, I love you very much. And I love you too, my dear, Mary said, wiping her eyes. Everything will be all right, you'll see. Meanwhile, in Brian's house, the lights were on late into the night. Brian and Mrs. Phillips sat in the kitchen, having discussed everything a thousand times already, and now they were silent. Each of them was unsure of what to do next. Carolina had left them with a problem to solve. Eric was wheezing in his room, and the Christmas lights in the living room blinked. New Year's was only a day away, but there was no joy. Mrs. Phillips went to bed and fell into a heavy sleep. Brian went outside. It was a freezing night. Star droplets twinkled in the dark sky, as if trying to give Brian a hint. He breathed in the crisp air but couldn't seem to catch his breath. Something was weighing on his chest, anger, pain, confusion, and uncertainty. How was this possible? He was supposed to be Eric's father, yet he wasn't really his father. And there was another boy, just like Eric, so close, but not his son. Brian suddenly realized that he was worrying about the other boy as if he were his own son. The other boy's mother was a stranger to Brian, but she was Eric's biological mother. In the distance, an owl hooted, and a dog barked. Brian rubbed his temples and reached for his pack of cigarettes. He didn't realize it until he finished the whole pack. His head felt heavy and empty. He sighed heavily and went back inside. He couldn't figure out how to live with this truth. In the morning, he dreamed of Carolina. She smiled at him, caressed his hair gently, and remained silent. Brian watched his wife, and it felt like she was alive. Carolina, how do I go on, he asked her. She didn't answer. She smiled again, then suddenly began to glow, brighter and brighter until she became transparent like mist and drifted away into a cloud. Just live, her voice echoed from afar. And be happy. Brian opened his eyes. Eric was sleeping next to him, apparently sneaking in during the night, and Brian didn't even notice. He covered his son with a blanket and gave him a kiss. Of course, he was Eric's father, a real one. With this thought, he carefully got out of bed and went to the kitchen. Mrs. Phillips was making pancakes. Her eyes were suspiciously red. Have you been crying? Brian looked at her closely. I didn't sleep well all night, I was thinking, Mrs. Phillips sobbed. What are we going to do now? I've been thinking about that too, Brian admitted. Brian, I want to tell you something. Don't judge Caroline, don't be mad at her. She did what she thought was best. I know that. 
Well, there's one thought that's been bothering me. Sometimes fate gives us a sign, and we don't understand right away what's required of us. Mary, she might not have appeared here for no reason. No, I don't mean that she was looking for us, to take Erica away. I realized that's not the case. She's a poor, unhappy girl who had to make a difficult decision on her own. But it just so happened that she ended up in our village. Two brothers have met. So, maybe it's a good thing they saw each other while they're still young. Now they'll know each other. I don't understand what you're getting at, Brian was surprised. I mean that blood brothers should grow up together. Brian froze. Was she saying that he should give Mary's son, Eric, away with his own hands? Mrs. Phillips understood everything from Brian's expression and waved her hands. No, no. What are you thinking? I won't give Eric away to anyone. But the other boy, Lucas, he's exactly like my grandson. I won't be able to sleep peacefully knowing that he's wandering around somewhere. Mrs. Phillips was voicing Brian's thoughts, and he just listened in silence. I think Mary is a good girl. Brian, what if you make a deal with her? Come to an agreement. Mrs. Phillips, I don't need anyone but Caroline. I loved her and still love her. We can't bring my daughter back, but Eric needs a mother, Mrs. Phillips sighed. Think about it. Brian just shook his head and walked out into the yard. It was already dawn. He opened the gate and stepped onto the street. People were hurrying past to catch a bus. The stop was just 50 yards away. Brian noticed a woman with a child and a large bag waiting at the bus stop. It was Mary with Lucas. Brian quickened his pace. He walked towards Mary, not fully realizing what he was doing. Seeing him, Mary stepped back. Sleepy Lucas clung to his mother. Brian approached, greeted the people who were at the stop, about ten in all, and who were all looking curiously at him. Without a word, he took Mary's bag. Let's go to our place, Brian said quietly. Why? Mary's voice trembled. Just to live. Simply live. And raise our sons, Brian said clearly. The people at the stop were stunned to hear this. This is a movie, they thought. But Mary and Brian didn't care about the onlookers. They stood and looked at each other in silence. The headlights of a bus appeared and the people rushed to get on. Only these two remained standing. Mama, Lucas's voice was heard. Are we not going anywhere? There was so much hope in the child's voice. You're not going anywhere, Brian replied for her. He picked up the boy with one hand, held the bag tightly in the other, and headed towards his house. Mary followed after a moment of hesitation. The people on the bus watched them with interest, discussing what was happening and wondering whose children they were. They celebrated New Year's Eve as a happy family, Brian, Mary, Eric, Lucas, and Mrs. Phillips. The boys were happy to be living together. Mary was embarrassed all the time. It was all so new to her, living with Brian and Mrs. Phillips. Who was she? What was she doing there? But only when she looked at her boys did her face light up with a smile. Running, shouting, laughing, they were hers, her two little ones. Surprisingly, Eric quickly found a common language with Mary and, seizing a moment, whispered in Mrs. Phillips's ear, Grandma, is Aunt Mary going to live with us for sure? Mrs. Phillips nodded. And if I call her mom? Will my mom Carolina be offended? Lucas calls her mom, and I really want to, the little boy asked anxiously. Mom Carolina won't be upset, reassured his grandmother, and Eric ran over to Mary and hung onto her neck. Mom, he shouted. Mommy. Lucas froze in surprise for a second, and then he too rushed to hug Mary, and she laughed and cried while hugging them both. Brian watched them thoughtfully, Mrs. Phillips was right. Life goes on, and maybe everything will work out for him and Mary. A month later, Brian went to work on his shift. He and Mary had a simple friendship. She often called him and told him how the boys were doing and how she was working at the club. By the way, she really enjoyed her job at the rural community center. The people who were initially wary of her, and even surprised by her, finally warmed up to her. 
They joined clubs and rehearsals. Eric and Lucas went to kindergarten, and no one was surprised by their resemblance anymore. In the village, there are no secrets. Everyone already knew what had happened. People said a lot of things, different things, but in the end, everyone agreed, everything that happens, happens for the best. Three months later, Brian returned from his shift and stayed home. He was offered a job driving the chairman of the village council. He agreed. He was tired of those shifts and missed his boys. Now he really believed that he had two sons. How else could it be? They were so similar, their hairstyles even became alike. Still, Brian, Mary, and Mrs. Phillips could always tell who was Eric and who was Lucas. But Eric was bolder, even a little cheeky, and Lucas became more cautious. But otherwise, the brothers were indistinguishable. But Mary and Brian remained just friends, even though they lived in the same house. Every day, they realized that they were drawn to each other. Brian was held back by the memory of Carolina, and Mary was simply shy. Essentially, she didn't know what true love was. One day in August, at the end of summer, they went to the forest to pick mushrooms. The kids wandered around the clearing with Mrs. Phillips, Brian went in one direction, and Mary went in the other. Suddenly, Brian heard Mary scream and rushed to her aid. There's a wolf, Mary shouted, pointing to the bushes. A wolf, Brian was surprised. There aren't any animals like that around here. Well, who's over there then? Such a grey one. And suddenly a huge rabbit jumped out of the bushes, terrified to death, and ran away. Rabbit, Mary laughed and blushed, and I thought it was something else. Oh, you scaredy cat, Brian smiled and unexpectedly hugged Mary, then kissed her. Mary trembled, but didn't push the man away, and responded timidly. I'm grateful to this rabbit, Brian whispered. For what? Mary was surprised. If it weren't for him, I would have been scared to kiss you for another thousand years. And they kissed again, while the boys looked at them from afar and exchanged glances, mom and dad are kissing. Mrs. Phillips also watched them and only smiled. Finally. These two will be happy. And she had no resentment towards Brian. He just had to live this life happily, for himself and for her daughter. In November, Mary and Brian got married. Now they became a real family, and a month later Mary realized she was pregnant. Brian was upset when he found out. Mary, my dear, you can't have this child, he said bitterly. Remember what happened with Caroline. But Mary stubbornly shook her head, whatever fate decides, it will be. And she is not Caroline's judge for her unborn child. The pregnancy went smoothly. And the closer the due date, the more Brian worried. Mrs. Phillips, who lived with them and who had become like a daughter to Mary, also worried. Will this girl repeat the fate of her daughter? Only Mary was calm. She worked at the club until the last month, took care of the boys, and took care of the house. And two weeks before the birth, Brian took her to the city to the maternity hospital. Knowing their difficult situation, the doctors insisted on giving birth in the city. Mary called early in the morning. We have a daughter, she whispered into the phone. A daughter, Brian woke up instantly. Mary, why are you whispering? That's how our little one is sleeping next to me. Everything is fine, everything is good. 3.3 kilograms, 52 centimeters. Brian couldn't believe this miracle. Could it be that 1%, the only one? Then he picked up Mary and their daughter from the maternity hospital. They arrived home. Mrs. Phillips and the boys were there to greet them. And we decided what to name our little sister, Eric announced from the doorway. And what's that? Mary smiled. Caroline, replied Lucas, and everyone nodded in agreement. Of course, Caroline. And let her be the happiest. Two years passed. Caroline grew into a strong and healthy girl. Mary had already started working. Lucas and Eric were already attending school. One day, a luxurious foreign car stopped near their house. A young woman got out of it. Mrs. Phillips was busy with her granddaughter in the yard. Seeing the stranger, the elderly woman went to meet her, taking Caroline in her arms. 
Excuse me, does Mary live here? I was told in the store that this is her house, the woman said. And who are you? Mrs. Phillips looked surprised as she examined this well-groomed, curly-haired girl. Me? Oh, nobody, I suppose, but I need to see her, the girl said. Mrs. Phillips wanted to send the girl away, but didn't have the chance. Mary approached the house. You're Mary, the girl exclaimed with joy. Suppose I am. And who are you? Mary raised her eyebrows. She didn't recognize the girl. My name is Teresa. I'm Mr. Davis's daughter. Does that name mean anything to you? No, Mary replied sharply and blushed slightly. You're mistaken, go away. No, wait. It's you, exclaimed Teresa. I've been looking for you for so long. Listen, I have good intentions. And Teresa, stuttering and nervous, told Mary that her father had died in a car accident a year ago. Sometime in conversation, her mother mentioned that her father had once hurt a girl very badly and then took away her only home. Her mother said the girl was pregnant. As soon as I imagined how poor she must have felt, with no money and a child. And I was so ashamed of my father. How could he? I don't understand. And my mother, she was wrong too. She forgave my father for all his infidelities, but was ready to chase his mistresses out of town. I understand that they were others, but this girl was so hurt. And I decided to find her. It cost me a lot of effort, but I have a good detective. And he found you, Mary. I know you gave birth to my father's child. You have two twin sons, so they're my brothers. I'd like to help you. Interesting. How? Mary finally spoke after listening to Teresa. With money, of course, Teresa smiled. Just tell me where to transfer it, and I'll take care of everything. Teresa, I don't want anything from your family, Mary firmly replied. Please leave, or I'll call the police. Mary, you're being unreasonable. We can get along well. I can take the boys with me on weekends. We'll have a great time together. I can even take them to the sea. Isn't that wonderful? I sincerely think so. I repeat, we don't need anything from you. Well, you're missing out. Oh well, I'll come again. Teresa shrugged, got into her beautiful car, and drove away. Mary and Mrs. Phillips stood at the gate, watching the car go. I don't understand why she does this, Mrs. Phillips asked. She's trying to atone for her father's sins, Mary answered angrily. Then she calmed down a bit and smiled. She should go to church instead. That's true, Mrs. Phillips agreed. And a month later, it became known why this Teresa had come. All television channels showed that the daughter of a famous banker had been detained at the airport with a stranger's child. It turned out that Teresa had a sick child who urgently needed a kidney transplant. The donor could only be a close relative, another child. So she was looking for one. Her father was quite a ladies' man, and Teresa decided to search among his former mistresses. She learned about Mary too. That's why she came and offered to take the boys to the sea. Her intentions were not good, but rather malicious. When Mary refused, she found another woman who also had a child by Mr. Davis. Teresa was able to win her over and offered to take her child abroad to the sea. The woman agreed. But at the last moment, someone called and told everything. Fortunately, Teresa didn't have time to take the child abroad. Now she's arrested, and her child has been helped in other ways. A donor was found without all of this. When Mary learned the whole story, she was so scared. People can be so wicked. It's frightening to think about our boys, she told Brian. What fate awaits them? They have the blood of Mr. Davis running through their veins. God forbid his character ever shows up in them. Well, what's the difference? Brian shook his head. What does it matter whose blood it is? There are children, my sons. I raise them, and they'll be like me. They'll do as I do. Yes, you're right. Children follow the example of their parents. And you're the best dad for our sons. 
And what about our daughter? Brian laughed. And for Carolina too, Mary smiled. They were sitting in the yard, their daughter playing nearby on the grass. Lucas and Eric were repairing their bicycles for the first time by themselves. Mrs. Phillips was baking her signature pancakes in the kitchen. The smell was heavenly. Soon Mrs. Phillips would call everyone to the table. Everyone was waiting, and clouds were drifting across the sky. And someone up there, unseen, was nearby, watching closely to ensure that this family was doing well because they had already been through so much. Now they simply had to be happy. He watched closely from above. Or was it she?